Welcome, welcome. Good evening, everyone. I'm Robert Rabin. I've been asked to read, which I'm going to do, <laughs> except I wore, I wore my cute glasses, but they're not bifocals, so you're going you're gonna to bear with me. I'm, I'm Robert Rabin, and I am an extremely proud board member of the New Press. Welcome uh, to our 30th anniversary Social Justice Awards. We are so pleased that you could join us and so pleased that so many of us uh, could be here this evening to celebrate both the New Press and, importantly, our honorees. The New Press is a mission-driven book publisher. We're committed to books. We're committed to their physical beauty, to their unique social and cultural power as tools for sparking public discussion and for shaping the landscape of ideas in the United States. Every time I look up, I see another author. It's really, really a beautiful thing. New Press Books aim to amplify under, we don't aim to amplify, New Press Books amplifies underrepresented voices, critical voices, progressive voices, giving them an opening into a media that is too often dominated by the loudest and the least informed perspectives. We change that reality book by book. You may already know our books, but you may not know the work that goes on behind each book, the intentional effort to produce books that are tools for social change. New press editors collaborate closely for months and years with some of the nation's leading social justice advocates and experts, people like Michelle Alexander, Steve Phillips, Susan Lin, Ai Jin Poo, Paul Butler, Danielle Sered, Ellie Mistel, and so many more. Robert, turn page. <laughs> That's some amazing staffing. <laughs> New Press staff partners with hundreds of like-minded organizations, places like the Brennan Center. A shout out for the Brennan Center, I know you're here. <laughs> the Vera Institute, the Roosevelt Institute, Democracy and Color, the National Domestic Workers Alliance to help project their work and their experts onto a national screen. And we collaborate closely with more media organizations than we can count, from the largest mainstream outlets to the smallest progressive podcast to help maintain and, yes, even grow that vital space for genuine democratic discussion and debate. Like our honorees tonight, the New Press is committed to using the power of the written word to engage in critical conversations and to fight for social change. To tell you more about recent developments of the New Press, I'm delighted to introduce our visionary leader, our chief program manager, our fundraiser, <laughs> our incredible executive director, Diane Wachtel. Short people. Thank you, Robert. That was lovely. Um, that was lovely for me and lovely for the new press. Thank you very much. Um, also, I want to start off by thanking our co-chairs tonight, um, Sarah Burns and Cynthia Young. Cynthia, where are you? <laughs> hiding, hiding over there. Um, you have made this evening possible. You make a lot of the things at the new press possible. Um, and we could not be more grateful. Thank you. Um, I want to congratulate Fritz Schwartz. I'm so sorry that Fritz could not be here tonight to receive his award in person, but Fritz's family is here. Um, Ricky Pereira, his wife, and his sons, Eric and Christopher, thank you for taking time out of your lives to join us. And we will try to do Fritz proud, and we'll videotape the whole thing so he can watch it at home. Um, Fritz, as many of you know, is one of the great civic lions of the last half century. He's had a storied public and private career and has served on more high-level public bodies of consequence than I could begin to recite here. Um, you will hear a little bit more about him. We have a wonderful tribute from Gara LaMarche coming up. Um, but I wanted to tell you that I had the privilege of editing two of Fritz's books, 
uh, democracy in the dark and unchecked and unbalanced about government secrecy and presidential power. Um, and so I got to experience his brilliance and his wisdom and his charm, which is considerable, firsthand. Um, it is a pleasure to honor him tonight, and we will hear more about him in a few minutes. Um, Nicole, Hannah Jones, um, I am a huge fan and have been a huge fan. Um, I have been an admirer from afar, and I don't know if you know this, but when the 1619 Project came out in magazine form, I immediately called Joe Kahn at the Times and said, please, 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 can I publish that as a book? Um, it was already spoken for. Good for you, bad for me. Um, it did, as um, you all know, went on, I believe, to win a Pulitzer, your work for that did. Um, it is an amazing, amazing book. Uh, we have copies of it here tonight. I believe Nicole is willing to sign them. Is that true? Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe, if you're very nice. Um, it is an amazing paradigm-shifting book that seeks to reframe the country's origin story by placing it in the context of slavery and the continuing legacy of slavery, um, placing those at the center of our national narrative. Um, you will be hearing more both about Nicole and from Nicole uh, this evening. Uh, I just want to say how thrilled I am that you could join us, and congratulations and thank you for coming tonight. Okay, so turning to politics, I think we can all breathe a bit of a sigh of relief uh, after the midterms. Um, you, I only lost a little. So, I, did you, I'm, Ellie, did you even come up with this? I heard it described not as a red wave, but a pink puddle. I thought that was good. I thought that was good. I did not say that. Um, and what I wanted to, I was going to use that to pivot to you and say that we have one of our own standout political authors here tonight uh, to be in conversation with Nicole Hammond-Jones, which is going to be just amazing. Um, Ellie Mistal, uh, you know him from TV, and he's the nation's legal com uh, commentator, legal what? Commentator. Thank you, that, what he said. Um, and uh, used to be the big editor at Above the Law. He's very snarky. Um, his book, Allow Me to Re Retort a Black Guy's Guide to the Constitution, which was his debut book, shot to the number two spot on the New York Times bestseller list. I had the privilege of, of editing that book also. And it's a very little book with a very lot of dirty words in it. I, there is more profanity in Ellie's little book than in all the other books I've edited in my career <laughs> put together, just saying. Um, but congratulations, Ellie, on your book. It is so great to be able to celebrate that here tonight with you and your wife. Um, and uh, now, that book is a very, very hot item, and we were not able to get copies for all of you here in time tonight. But if you would like a copy, I think there's a sign-up sheet just let us know, and we would be delighted to send you a copy with our compliments. Um, okay, so briefly, for the few people in the room who may not know the new press, um, we are a 501c3, not-for-profit, public interest book publisher. We publish books in the public interest. Um, we publish across the spectrum of progressive ideas, in certain circles, we are known these days as the publisher of the new Jim Crow, um, but we have published so many important paradigm-shifting, prize-winning books. Um, in the last year alone, in addition to Ellie's bestseller, we did a book with Noam Chomsky and Vijay Prashad on US foreign policy in Afghanistan. We did a memoir with the internationally renowned feminist Devaki Jain. We published Susan Lin's book, Who's Raising the Kids on Big Tech and Children, which was greeted with a full-page rave review by Zephyr Teachout in the New York Times book review. We did Mariam Kaba's book on defunding the police. We did Steve Phillips' book called How We Win the Civil War on the fight between democracy and white supremacy. And we are publishing books by two sitting US senators, uh, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, 
uh, just came out with a book about the role of dark money in capturing the Supreme Court. And uh, Senator Jeff Merkley is, has a forthcoming book on the filibuster. Uh, we have won any number of prizes in the past year. You will remember we were on a total high at, this, at the gala in 2021. An author of ours from the 1990s, is that right? Yeah, from the 1990s, had just won the Nobel Prize in Literature, which like, just blew our minds. Um, since then, our book, Mouths of Brain, an anthology of black lesbian essays, has won two different awards, including the Lambda Literary Award. Catherine Flowers' book called Waste, on the sanitary neglect inflicted on poor communities across the US, won a leading environmental award. Um, and in a major development last December, right after the gala, so I did not share it with you then, it happened right after, our very own publisher, Ellen Adler, was named Person of the Year by Publishers Weekly. <laughs> Ellen. I mean, you just have you just stop and think about that for a minute. Out of every single per person working in the publishing industry, Ellen was the, the person of the year. She's been it all year. We've been reveling in it. Um, in addition to being an incredibly wonderful and astute, brilliant publisher, Ellen is also an editor. She's sitting next to one of her authors, Suhaila Abdulali. <laughs> Suhaila's book, What We Talk About When We Talk About Rape, was a major addition uh, to our list on, on femini feminist issues. Um, and Ellen was also the editor of Arlie Hochschild's book, Strangers in Their Own Land, which you may remember was published in 2016, right as Trump was running for election, um, and explained that whole phenomenon. Uh, that was a National Book Award finalist book. Um, so Ellen, multi-talented person of the year. Unbelievable. Um, the New Press publishes south of 40 books a year in an industry that publishes a quarter million new titles every year. So I think it's fair to say that we punch a little bit above our weight. Um, I wanted to recognize, while we're recognizing people, and I'm not sure he's in the room, but I saw him downstairs, a former social justice award winner. Is Joe here, Joe Stiglitz? Joe was here downstairs, and he was here with his wife, Anya Schifrin, who, uh, and uh, Lena Schifrin, who are respectively the daughter and wife of our founder, Andre Schifrin. Uh, Anya is also a New Press author. And um, Lena, I thought she would be here. I would just tell a very brief anecdote, which is when we incorporated the New Press, we needed to put together a board of directors, and the minimum number of people was three. So that would be Andre Schifrin, Diane Wattel, and... Mm, Lena Schiffman, why not? So <laughs> Lena is a, a founding board member of the New Press. I'm not sure she even knows that. Um, anyway, we are here tonight to celebrate the New Press's 30th anniversary. I, I think Andre, I don't know, uh, in his wildest dreams, that he could have imagined this event 30 years out with all of you here and all we have to celebrate. Uh, three decade, decades of publishing books that have changed the narrative across the, the progressive spectrum. Uh, we have not just stayed afloat, but we have thrived. Um, I, I am proud and pretty incredulous um, at how resilient and resourceful the New Press team has been, especially over the last couple of very challenging years. So we definitely have something to celebrate tonight. Small things we did already to celebrate our anniversary. We, um, Maury, is Maury Baton here? Designed a beautiful 30th anniversary logo for us, which is on your masks. We had an incredible alumni reunion where people who had worked for us or interned for us all the way back in the 1990s showed up to celebrate. Uh, I was asked to write a piece for Publishers Weekly on progressive publishing, and see me if you want to read that. I'm happy to send it to you. Um, and we did an oral history of the New Press's first 10 years, which you will find in your gift bag uh, as a way of sort of trying to capture the start of, of an organization that has gone on to become, I think, a, a significant player in the not-for-profit media uh, realm. So I'm gonna wrap up by saying, as most of you know, that the New Press is a unique hybrid institution. We're part commercial press. We're a dot com. A lot of people just think of us as the publishing house, uh, but we're also a social change not-for-profit. 
and in order to walk that unusual line to use our books to leverage social change, we rely on a range of contributed support. Some of it, a lot of it, comes from major philanthropies that you've heard of. We have significant funding from the Ford Foundation, from Open Society, from MacArthur, from Art for Justice, from Wellspring, from Schmidt, Emerson, California Wellness, Omidyar. You may have heard some uh, West Coast techie things in there. Um, that's where the money is these days. Um, also, from some very important organizations that we work with uh, every day, um, including two that I'd like to call out, Maple Press, who prints all of our beautiful, beautiful books, and who have helped us navigate this very difficult supply chain times, and our distributor, Ingram Two Rivers. Um, between those two organizations, we have been able to make it through, I think, one of the most challenging periods in publishing history. Um, so thank you, Two Rivers and Ingram, for your support and your partnership. Um, finally, thank you, all of you, for coming tonight, for supporting us. We could not do what we do without your help and support. We have an exciting conversation for you ahead. And uh, first, we are going to present our uh, social Justice Awards. In order to do that, I would like to call to the stage the renowned literary agent, New Press board member, and my dear, dear friend, Sarah Burns. <laughs> See, you didn't think I was going to do that, did you? <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, as Diane said, I'm Sarah Burns. I'm a literary agent at the Gernert Company, um, and I'm a proud board member of the New Press. Um, and as um, Diane said to me earlier tonight, uh, I get to do the fun part. I uh, get to give out the awards. Um, so thank you all for joining us this evening as we celebrate the New Press and honor the contributions of two extraordinary individuals who are an inspiration to us all and exemplify so well all that the New Press has championed over the last 30 years. We'll begin this evening's award ceremony starting with the 2022 Social Justice Award nominee, Frederick A. O. Schwartz, Jr., who many of us know as Fritz. Fritz is one of the nation's great civic-minded lawyers with decades of high-level leadership in both private practice and public service. To tell us more about his civic commitments and his considerable contributions to the public interest, we'll enjoy a tribute video by New Press board chair, Gary LaMarche, who could not be here today in person to present to his friend and mentor, Fritz, Fritz Schwartz. Good evening, everyone. I've never missed a New Press Gala since becoming board chair, but I'm in London right now and very sorry I can't be with you tonight. Well, I'm not in London on this video since I'm taping it beforehand, otherwise I'd arrange to have Big Ben in the background. But I'm in London as you hear this, most likely fast asleep. I'm especially sorry to be absent this year because I'm very excited about the two recipients of our Social Justice Awards who stand in a long and distinguished lineage that includes Harry Belafonte, Toni Morrison, Brian Stevenson, Jamie Raskin, Michelle Alexander, and many others. I admire greatly the work of Nicole Hannah-Jones, but more than that, I've been changed by it. Like the best of the works that the new press brings into our public discourse, her 1619 project has profoundly shifted the national conversation and helped many of us see our history and what we must do to bring about the future we need in a very different light. Fritz Schwartz has been my friend, colleague, and mentor for many years, and it's a privilege to be in community with him now as a key member of the New Press Board. I've often referred to Fritz as one of a vanishing breed, the quintessential civic-minded lawyer. Fritz was born to privilege. Whenever I've introduced him that way, he balks, but being the scion of a Fifth Avenue toy emporium family might be seen by some as a bit of a leg up in life. But from his earliest days, Fritz gravitated toward injustice. In 1960, the year he graduated from Harvard Law School, he organized a picket of a Woolworth store in Cambridge, Massachusetts, in solidarity with civil rights protesters in North Carolina. 
The next year, he spent in newly independent Nigeria, helping to write a new constitution. His brilliant career over the next 60 years balanced a successful tenure as a partner at Cravath, Swain & Moore with periods of public service at the highest and most sensitive levels. He was chief counsel to the Senate Intelligence Committee, which uncovered CIA abuses, like illegal spying on American activists and assassination plots against foreign leaders. He was Corporation Counsel of New York City, commanding an army of public lawyers in defending gay rights and minority hiring programs, fighting for inclusion of persons with AIDS in city classrooms, pressing the Reagan administration over legal cuts in disability benefits, and reshaping ethics and lobbying laws. Later, as chair of New York's Charter Revision Commission, Fritz led the process of rewriting the civic arrangements of the city, ending the unrepresentative and boss-controlled Board of Estimate, and ushering in the more democratic city council that we have today. The mayor Fritz served, Ed Koch, used a term many have applied to him, Renaissance man, and captured well the essence of Fritz's indispensability across many rooms and sectors. There is no area related to the needs of people, Koch said, in which Fritz is not an expert or can be within 24 hours. Virtually the minute Fritz retired from Cravath, he went into full-time public interest work as chief counsel of the Brennan Center for almost two decades now, where he has mentored young advocates and been a leader in the fight to protect and perfect our democracy. Along the way, he found time not only to chair a slew of boards, I was the beneficiary of his experienced hand at Atlantic Philanthropies, but to write two books for the new press, Unchecked and Unbalanced with Aziz Hook on Presidential Power in a Time of Terror, and Democracy in the Dark, The Seduction of Government Secrecy. Fritz is passionate and fair-minded, hardworking and fun-loving, a brilliant writer and talker, but also a peerless listener. He's made a lasting mark on the world, on many worlds, and on all who know him. It's my great honor to present Fritz Schwartz with the 2022 New Press Social Justice Award, a small token of a life well lived and of the many ways he continues to contribute powerfully to the public good. Um, I just want to say the last time I saw Fritz, um, he said, I think the press is doing well, don't you think? <laughs> I was like, I think it is. So we thank Gara for those moving words outlining Fritz's contributions to democratic values and good governance. As Fritz could not join us in person this evening, I would like to invite his wife, Ricky Pereira, to join us on stage now uh, to accept this Social 2022 Social Justice Award on behalf of Fritz. Yes, hold on one sec. So, more to say. Um, Ricky is an environmental health scientist herself uh, and the founder of the Columbia Center for Children's Environmental Health at the Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health. Ricky, on behalf of the new press, I am pleased uh, to present you with a 2022 New Press Social Justice Award in recognition of a lifetime of civic leadership and Fritz's unwavering commitment to democracy and government accountability. This is Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, well, these are the words of Fritz, who's so sorry he couldn't be here and is missing a great, great event. He starts by saying my thanks to Diane Wachtel, to Gara Lamarche, and the New Press Board for this award for social justice it means a great deal to me. As I look back over my life, I realize how fortunate I've been to contribute to the work for social justice and civil rights where great progress has been made, but which remain the key issues of our time. 
For my 60th reunion at Harvard University, I wrote about how luck has played a big role in my life, but as the saying goes, luck is the residue of desire. I've been fortunate to have had the opportunity to work with so many committed colleagues to oppose segregation in the South, to fight against apartheid in Africa as a member of the board of the American Committee on Africa, where I worked with three fellow board members closely tied to Dr. Martin Luther King, Bayard Rustin, Clarence Jones, and Stanley Levison. A few years later, I was again fortunate, this time to be asked to be the chief counsel to the Select Church Committee of the U.S. Senate created to investigate America's intelligence agencies. We discovered horrific abuses of power against individuals in the name of national security and were credited with some real reforms. Then as New York City Corporation Council, I had the opportunity to tackle social injustice, including the rampant environmental injustice with respect to siting of polluting sources in low-income communities and communities of color in the city. And then finally, I had the great, great good luck to become the chief counsel at the Brennan Center, such a force for justice, social justice, and for democracy. So these are just some of the opportunities I've had for which I am hugely grateful. And I'm also grateful for the work of the New Press, that rare nonprofit public interest publisher of books that advance social change and defend democratic values. This work is never so needed. So thank you. That's Fritz. <laughs> while our other 2022 Social Justice Award honoree this evening is Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, professor, and author, Nicole Hannah-Jones. It's difficult to overstate the impact that Nicole has had both as a writer and a public educator, particularly for the New York Times Magazine, which first published her influential essay, that led to the creation of the seminal 1619 Project, a book that places the legacy of 400 years of slavery and the contributions of black Americans at the center of the American story. It's a remarkable story that was first published in 2019 to mark the 400th anniversary of the arrival of enslaved Africans to the shores of what is now the United States. Nicole happens to be an esteemed client of my colleague at the Gurner Company, the beloved Nicole Hanna Habib, and we could not be prouder to represent her. And we at the New Press have deep admiration of Nicole's work and her commitment to providing a full and unflinching account of our country's complicated history and legacy. Her public challenges to the American caste system, her investigative journalism and public education, and her contributions to social and cultural criticism are continuing sources of inspiration to us all. Nicole. Now, now I read the little word. <laughs> Stay there for a sec. Um, we at the New Press, um, wait, oops, sorry, I get um, flustered. <laughs> Nicole Hannah Jones, on behalf of the New Press, I'm pleased to present you with the 2022 New Press Social Justice Award in recognition of your paradigm shifting work to challenge origin stories and deepen and broaden our country's democratic commitments. Thank you.
Raven reemerges. <laughs> and congratulates nominees, <laughs> honorees. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much for doing that. And congratulations again to tonight's honorees, Fritz Schwartz and Professor Nicole Hannah-Jones, who yesterday presided over a nation-changing launch of the Center for Journalism and Democracy at Howard. Uh, very, very, very exciting platform, which is going to revolutionize, which is well needed, uh, media newsrooms, um, the academy, and Professor Hannah Jones is the one to do it. Um, it's well, but not well enough funded. Right. How am I doing? <laughs> How am I doing? <laughs> Let me stop. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, turn the evening over to what will be an incredible, compelling uh, conversation between Professor Nicole Hannah-Jones and New Press author and Nation Justice correspondent Ellie Mistel. We're so fortunate to have uh, Ellie with us this evening. His recent New Press book, you hear that? His recent New Press book, <laughs> al Allow Me to Retort, a Black Guy's Guide to the Constitution was an instant New York Times bestseller, and it has only cemented his reputation as both the funniest lawyer in America and as one of our sharpest and most acerbic legal minds defending the idea of a fair and equal society, and we need you. Without further ado, please welcome in conversation two incredible, incredible minds and visionaries. Hi, hey everybody. Um, is that gone? Okay. Hi, I'm Ellie Mistal. You know me. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you all for supporting independent journalism. Nicole Hannah Jones, um, like literally my hero. Um, my book doesn't exist without your book. My work doesn't exist without your work. And I mean that, and I know that sounds weird because I'm a grown ass man. I can like take care of myself, right? The <laughs> Diane can attest, right? The, the first versions, the first kind of flutterings of my idea for my book um, were say, you know, similar in terms of the overview and the survey that I wanted to do, but really was around the idea of playing for all time zones, of being palatable for the widest kind of audience possible, for, for, for not making people too uncomfortable too quickly too soon. And I think as the idea iterated, and I read, and I read the book version of the project, there was a big feeling that I had of like, screw that. Because <laughs> you were out here not just telling your truth, you're out here telling the truth in a way that um, doesn't take account of who might be made uncomfortable by the truth. And as I started to develop, as I further developed my own book ideas, that kept coming up again and again and again and again. Why would I care what they're gonna say when I say this? Why would I care what they're gonna say when I say that? Can I back it up? Is there a case that I can point to? Is there a, a, a law that I can point to that makes my point yes? Well then, screw them. <laughs> I can't be the only one, <laughs> and I can't be the only person in that um, position. So my first question for you is more, you know, you, you, you know your work better than anybody else, and you read, what other tendrils do you see from your project? What other, what other books, what other, uh, um, um, what other scholarship do you see that, you know, lead, that, that, that you can feel some pride of inspiration for um, as you see your project kind of go through this society um, at an amazing level of penetration. Hello. <laughs> um, first, just thank you everyone and, and thank you so much for New Press for honoring me with this award. Um, when you look at who all has received this award, I don't feel like I'm, I'm quite up there, but, but, I, but I, I, I do humbly uh, accept it. 
um, I would take it home with me because my name is on it. Um, so, you know, I, I knew you were going to ask that question because you were gracious enough um, to give me some advance warning, but I, I can't really answer it because I, I, I don't know. I feel like as writers, um, we are all taking inspiration from each other, right? That, that all good writers are reading widely. They are, um, you know, pitting their own ideas against the ideas of other writers whom they admire. They're using other writers' ideas to sharpen their own ideas. So uh, any number of writers inspire my work, and, and I would hope um, that I'm inspiring other writers' work, but I, I, I don't know. Um, I would never read someone's work and say, they I must don't. have got that from me. <laughs> Unless they directly plagiarize me, I'll definitely take that. But um, so I, I, I don't know, I, I hope, I, I, I always think of myself in community. I, I write for our community, um, which you said, I mean, I, 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 I'm so appreciative and, and really honored by what you said because when I pitched the 1619 Project, of course, I'm very aware of who the New York Times audience is. And this probably sounds crazy, but I wasn't writing it for them, mm. right? So there wasn't, you know, I was always clear from the moment I pitched it that we were going to be unflinching. We were going to tell the story as it needed to be told and invite our writer, you know, readers to come along with us. But if New York Times readers loved it and our people didn't, it would have failed to me. So. Mm. Um, I appreciate that that, I and mean, I would imagine that's why your book has done so well. Because I think, I think that uh, many Americans, they don't want to be lied to, right? They don't want to be coddled. This is an ugly history. Our country is in an ugly place. This is why people have wanted to read the 1619 Project, is because, you know, we wanted, not we, I use we sometimes to be we, sometimes to be America. This is the y'all we. <laughs> Which is, you know, many white Americans wanted to think that the election of a black president had brought uh, along this post-racial era. And then we follow the election with, of a black president with a white nationalist president. And all of a sudden, people who wanted to think we had somehow banished this past that we have never dealt with um, were struggling to, to grapple with how we can whiplash between those two things. And the answer was always going to be with black people because I didn't know black people who were shocked by any of this, of course, right? Um, so I think treating your reader intelligently and not coddling your reader is what makes people read you, follow your crazy ass on Twitter. I thought I was bad on Twitter, but... <laughs> well, Woo! I... But anyway, so I, I, don't, I don't know. I will say, though, the most direct... There, there are certainly people who tell me directly, and, and I think the thing that I'm, I'm probably, uh, one of the things that I'm proud of is the way that the 1619 Project has inspired um, people in other countries mm. that are also have failed to grapple with the legacy of slavery to kind of take it as a Rosetta Stone on how they can start to work on that. So just recently, um, Brazil, which is where I've wanted the book to be the most because I just feel like if, if, you, if you want to see some, some correlates between nations, Brazil and ours, even the fact, you know, they had their tropical Trump and everything, um, that a group of journalists did their own version of the 1619 Project in Brazil. And if you know, you know, Brazil, the elite in Brazil have long wanted to pretend, like the elite here, that we don't really have a race, they don't have a race problem, they're not like the United States. Um, and it's called, I, I can't pronounce uh, Portuguese words, but it's Project Carreno, and it's named after the father of black history in Brazil. And it's been one of the most highest rated uh, podcasts in Brazil in the last few years, because similarly, by excavating this history of slavery there and the way that it shapes their society, people want to understand. And the history we've all been collectively taught is of a society that has never existed. Right? That mythology, that, that society has never been real. Um, and it doesn't explain January 6th. It doesn't explain what just happened. You know, Demo like you said, Democrats didn't lose as bad. Um, but even, it's razor sharp, right? Like everyone's breathing a sigh of relief. So I'm like, we're like 1.5 percentage points away from 
not having the same democracy. Like, that's not a victory. So anyway, all of that. I, I don't know who I'm inspiring, but I know, I, I hope that we are all as writers in community with each other and inspiring each other. Absolutely. I'm so glad you brought up the, the, the international aspect because I, I always feel like my, my family comes from, from Haiti, and I always feel like, uh, you know, Americans, we, we think of ourselves as Britain too, or, or, you know, that we're coming from that uh, tradition when actually our country looks more like a new world country all over the place than people would have you, would have you believe. Um, I, I, I want to get to one particularly American aspect um, of your work um, that I don't feel like, at least when I hear you, I don't feel like you get to talk about enough, and I don't feel like gets uh, promoted enough. Um, my wife, who's here, had the opportunity to hear you speak at J.P. Morgan, of all places. Um, one of... That was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what's so funny? I literally didn't know who had booked the who had booked this talk, and then I was like, "You can't take any photos with me next to J.P. Morgan." <laughs> And if you were there, I talked about the history and the involvement of J.P. Morgan in the slave trade. So I was like, okay, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. But anyway, moving on. I want you to do that. That's exactly, that's exactly where I was going because I think... There's one of no them, photographs of me next to any J.P. Morgan sign. That's all I'll say. I, I, I think one of the more fascinating and interesting parts of your work um, that, that truly was like a, a, you know, I did not know this. Um were the links between the particularly American system of slavery and the particularly American system of capitalism. Yes. And, and, and what American kind of modern day capitalism, not, not learned from slavery, but literally the practices that they adopted from slavery. Um, can you talk about that just a little bit? Because I think it's fascinating. And since there's no evidence that you were ever at exactly. J.P. Morgan, let's... it didn't happen. <laughs> I was just trying to find an ATM, that was it. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna get you for this one. Uh, so, you know, the, the two most contested essays of the project, right, the two essays that are the most talked about, that the most elite white power has come against have been are the two essays that go most directly to the pillars of um, the idea of American exceptionalism, right? Democracy, which is my opening essay, and Matt Desmond, which is the second essay on capitalism. And um, the essay on capitalism, so it, you know, the 1619 Project is more than anything else a work of memory. It is, you know, the history that happened, happened. But most of us just aren't taught a lot of it. So when we think about something as history, there's history that's the field of history, there's history that this happened on this day and this is who did it, but mostly what we're talking about is what have we been taught about what happened and how have we been taught to think about what happened, and that's memory. And that's memory that's largely shaped by power, and this is largely you know, to justify whatever hierarchies you have in society, whether they be racial hierarchy, whether they be economic hierarchy, um, and so, of course, the, the myth about the memory of capitalism is that, one, capitalism is the freest, greatest economic system in the history of the world. We treat capitalism almost as a, a moral system, not as a financial system. Um, and that slavery was a pre-modern, anti-capitalist institution that couldn't possibly have made people very much money because, of course, the free market was always going to be more successful and more um, profitable than literally forcing human beings to work for as long as you want them to for no pay. Which, and, and this, I just want to... Which is illogical, right? It's not just illogical, but it's also like an important part of the Republican myth-making around slavery that you'll see now, whereas that they try to, they're tr literally trying to say that the founding fathers put a poison pill against slavery in the Constitution, because they always wanted it to go away, but they just couldn't do it quite in their time, so they... But, but why couldn't they do it? because it was profitable, right? So even that argument, right? They couldn't do it because there was too much money to be made off of it. The wealthiest colony at the American Revolution was Virginia, and Virginia was a slave society, a slave colony. 40% of the population of Virginia were enslavers. And who were the men who wrote our founding documents? Thomas Jefferson, 
his job, he enslaved people for a living. That was his occupation. We call him a planter. He didn't plant shit. <laughs> he didn't. He forced enslaved black people through terror, through threat of violence, and through actual violence to do all the things, grow the tobacco, build Monticello. If you go to Monticello, you can see the fingerprints of children who were enslaved on that plantation. You can see their fingerprints in the bricks of the building on the backside of Monticello because while his white children were up in the house getting tutoring, the black children on that plantation were being forced to work for free to build it, right? So the father of the Constitution, enslaver from Virginia, Bill of Rights was written by an enslaver from Virginia, Patrick Henry, give me liberty or give me death unless you're black and I own you because he was an enslaver from Virginia. 10 of our first 12 presidents, right? So when we think about George that, Washington was the largest slaveholder in America at the time of the revolution. George Washington, I mean, 10 of our first 12, and most of them were Virginians, uh, were enslavers. And yet we're taught to think that one, slavery wasn't really profitable, and two, slavery was an asterisk to the American story. So when we understand um, how much effort has gone into the propaganda to make slavery seem unprofitable. The transatlantic slave trade was the largest force of migration in the history of the world. 13 million people that we know of transported from the continent of Africa into the Americas at sometimes 10 times the rate of white immigration. Right, when you go and have your good time in all of these black countries in the Caribbean, that's because they were remade by slavery. There were no black people in the Caribbean. Um, all of this is done because it was extremely profitable. And our nascent economy was built on slavery. We pay off our Revolutionary War debts by profits from slavery. We could not have had a revolution without the Southern colonies because that is where the money was, right? There is a reason why the men who were in the position to start the revolution and, and create our founding documents were Virginians. So anyway, so we've all, the way that we have to a lot of uh, countries practice slavery, of course. We all hear this, right? Slavery is one of the most ancient institutions in the world. True. Uh, chattel slavery, however, is not. But also, how many of those countries were founded on the ideas of liberty? How many of those countries were founded with a declaration that said, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, endowed by the creator with unalienable rights. Of these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But by the way, one-fifth of our population is in chattel slavery. It's that contradiction, right? It's that hypocrisy, which they are very aware of. Because if you read the words of George Washington, I'm a nerd, sorry. George Washington, he's, he's, he's writing letters saying, we need to break off from Britain because they want to treat us like we treat our black slaves. They want to make slaves of us. So even when we say, oh, they were men of their times, they didn't know, they absolutely know. They're defining white freedom by black slavery. Their freedom, right? The ideas of freedom is being defined against black slavery. So why do I say all of this? Because when we say the colonists wanted to abolish slavery, but they couldn't because it was profitable, that's like the most obvious thing in the world, right? The drug dealer doesn't want to sell drugs, <laughs> but it's profitable. No, right? Criminals commit crimes because they are profitable. And yet when it comes to these men of power and position, the helplessness that, yes, but it made them a lot of money, so they had to keep our people in bondage, speaks to... What could I do? I wanted a yacht. Right. I mean, they were all, uh, they were all debtors, for instance, right? Like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, they loved fabulous carriages. There's stories, if you read um, George Washington, Imperfect God, George Washington, Slavery and the Making of America, talks about how he would import these fabulous carriages, I guess it's like the modern day, you know, the, the olden time Maserati from Britain because he wanted to look fabulous, but he didn't have the money to do it. And so the lives of people who were human beings, they had to be enslaved to fund their lifestyle. And we don't want, we haven't wanted to grapple with that, which isn't really your question, but I, I tend to go on tangent. So just- It's a just, good answer still. Right, just to wrap it up, right? Slavery was extremely profitable. And when we think about all of the industries, it, it is convenient for us to think about slavery as just these backwards white Southerners. And we like to juxtapose it against, for instance, the Industrial Revolution. 
What do we think they were spinning in those factories? The Industrial Revolution doesn't happen without slave-grown cotton and slave-grown indigo. So even the Irish immigrant that I always hear about who came to America with nothing is making their living off of slavery because they are working in that textile mill with slave-grown cotton. The farmer in Iowa is growing crops, corn, wheat, other crops, and sending it down south because southern farms are only growing commodities to sell. So they're not growing food products. The person who's building the ships, the person who's making the rum, the banks on Wall Street, the insurers, right? All of this, this was a national endeavor. And it was, it was we did not have a capitalist system in America until slavery. And so there's a, there's a it's called the new history of capitalism, which is contested because the old history of capitalism needs to justify slavery. And so pretend that slavery was just backwards, it was naturally going to die out. If it was naturally going to die out, we wouldn't have had to fight a war to end it. We wouldn't have been the last in the Americas to end slavery. Most of us are kind of led to believe that, yeah, we had slavery, but we led in abolition. Only nope. two countries took longer than us in the Americas to end slavery. That was Brazil and that was Cuba. And only one other took a war, and what was that one? Thank you. Um, so again, when we think about, like we've all been taught the same collective lies about our country. And those lies justify power. They justify why, you know, how many times have we heard when we see inequality in our country, we're a capitalist society. We're a capitalist society. And we justify all of this inequality, this immoral systems. Because when you are a country where your system, your economic system was literally founded on human slavery, you can't go any lower than that. Anything can be justified in a society like that. So uh, read, read, read chapter two of the book, sorry. That was a long, that was a long lecture and, and the undergirding uh, text. But there's an entire new, um, it's not really new, like Capitalism and Slavery by Eric Williams was making this argument 50 years ago, and like many black scholars, he was dismissed because white scholars didn't want to grapple with the truth about slavery, and then it takes you know 50 years, and now there's a whole field mostly of white scholars uh, who are making the arguments that Eric Williams made before. Um, but it's there, we just, we don't want to grapple with it. I play a, a video game called Civilization. It's a long standing, oh, okay, some of you have played it, right? So in Civ, right now we're on to Civ 6, in Civ 4, <laughs> Um, it was the only version, so this game you like, you start in 300,000, 3000 BC and you start with a settler and you build it all up to the space race and you go to the Alpha Centauri and that, that's the game, right? So it covers the swath of human history and only one version of the game had slavery in it. All the other versions of the game just like, oh, there's no slavery, but they just, just skip over it, right? Um, which, trust me, as a black person, I actually appreciate because <laughs> of what Civ IV did with slavery and one of the really interesting things that Civ IV did with slavery that goes to your point. When, you're, when you uh, got into slavery, you, uh, your, your civilization in the video game would be a better producer. Like, you would make more stuff. That's true. But when you got out of slavery, you made more money because mm -hmm. workers who were free naturally make more profits. And even as, you know, at this point, a 20-year-old playing this game, I'm like, no... No, no. You don't make more money off of slavery, uh, without slavery. You make more money with the slaves. That's why they kept it, to your point. But when you're talking about how people are taught, I'm literally talking about a video game having this little nugget. That's just incorrect. Um, I want to bring you to the present day, and it's funny, we were talking, you were like, you try not to stay in the present day, so I, I, I'll, I'll bring it back to you. Uh, I never I, said that. You, you, you said you, tr you try not to concern yourself too much about what's going on today because you're thinking about longer term things. Oh, that's just when I'm writing. Oh. <laughs> no, I, I don't like to write. Okay, anyway, never mind. Don't misquote me, man. Okay, but that's what I got from you. Okay. okay. Um, the election just happened. We only lost by a little. Um, I, 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 I talk, I, in my work, I talk a lot about gerrymandering. Um, because that is a huge yes. um, reason why the country looks the way it looks, why the House looks the way it, the House of Representatives particularly looks the way it looks, and why various state houses look the way they look. Um, you talk a lot about how where black people happen to live 
is not an accident. That's not just, that's not the Adam Smith invisible hand, just people moving for, that, that where black people happen to live, where minority communities happen to live is not an accident. So I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, especially in the context of gerrymandering where we see black communities either packed so that they are, their, their voice is diluted or cracked so that their voice is diluted. Either way, whatever helps um, the ruling party. But, it was, but specifically with an understanding that like where we live and the extent to which I'm thinking specifically that sometimes black people live a straddle across two county lines making it very difficult for them to come together to, uh, to execute political power, power in either county. Like, how is, that, how is that one of our legacies or hangovers um, from 400 years of repression? Okay. Um, so, so one, I, I, no one happens to live anywhere. And, you know, you can read a book like Color of Law, you can look at a redlining map, um, you can look at civil rights cases going back, you know, 70 to 80 years, that of course, the, the segregation that we see in our society was architected. Um, we like to think that people just naturally grouped each other with each other, but um, particularly in the South, black people actually lived quite intimately with white people, obviously. Um, and in the North, until you started, you saw the Great Migration where six million black people leave the South, uh, most black people were living in integrated white neighborhoods as well. Um, most of the segregation that we see today was created by the federal government through redlining. We, many of us have heard of redlining. Most people think the banks invented redlining, but it wasn't. It was our government. Um, when the federal government decided uh, at the time of the Great Depression that it wanted to try to build a middle class, which um, back then the white was always silent, so they were going to build a white middle class, and they were going to start insuring home loans. And in order to decide, before that, if you wanted to buy a house, you had to put down between 50 to 60 percent down payment, which most Americans could not afford. And so the federal government decides we're going to help build wealth through home ownership by insuring loans, which means we will guarantee the loans with the bank. And to decide which uh, loans they would guarantee, they literally pulled out maps of the city, looked at the racial demographics in neighborhoods and began to color code these maps in any neighborhood that was black or integrated would get outlined in red. And the federal government would not insure loans in that neighborhood. And so the banks adopted it. The banks wouldn't loan in those neighborhoods. Um, and housing prices began to be driven by those maps. Um, and so white neighborhoods with the same housing stock as a black neighborhood would get a uh, higher housing price. And if you were a white person living in an integrated neighborhood, you had to move. Because if you wanted to get a loan, you couldn't get one in the neighborhood that you lived in. So when we think about kind of these truisms, right, that when black people move into a neighborhood, the housing prices go down. It wasn't because black people, it was because the federal government ensured that housing prices would literally go down because you would lose your ability to get a federally uh, insured loan. Then there were certain policies. So Baltimore had one of the first laws where Baltimore said it mandated housing segregation. If you were white, you couldn't live, and you lived on a block that was more than 50% black, you had to move, and vice versa. So it was eventually struck down by the Supreme Court. We had real estate covenants, right, where entire white neighborhoods were constructed with, in the deed, you, matter of fact, most of New York, um, including Long Island, most of New York City, I think Queens probably had the highest rate of per capita of real estate covenants in the nation, where entire neighborhoods, by deed, were off limits to black people moving in. Levittstown was founded as an all-white suburb that black people were prohibited from moving into, funded by the federal government. So black people, we don't happen to live anywhere. We were forcibly segregated into neighborhoods. Then those neighborhoods were deprived of normal government and financial resources. And to this day, right, when white people start moving into a neighborhood and the housing prices go up, it's not because white people are better caretakers of community. It's because we literally have a dual racialized housing system where white people bring value uh, to our communities. And so the problem is, though, I mean, that's a problem, clearly. Um, 
but racial segregation then has been used to gain political power, right, through representative government. So most black people can't win countywide office and they can't win statewide office. And this is why you saw during the Civil Rights Movement with the Voting Rights Act, uh, black people were suing for representative government, right? We don't want to run in countywide office. We want you to provide districts for us to run in because then that segregation allows us to elect someone who looks like us. Or really not just looks, just allows us to elect who we want. Yes, but often we want black people, politically black. <laughs> right. I mean, right? Like right, you, right, you right. want representative government. You don't want to be in Mississippi and have no white elected officials. And you do want people who come from your community and re represent your community. But yes, not exclusively, obviously. Okay, so, but now that's being used against mm -hmm. black people. So what gerrymandering does, gerrymandering, it's like all things in America. Gerrymandering can be a tool of good and equality, or it can be corrupted and it can become a tool of inequality. And I think this was, you know, the, the most, um, successful tactic out of the civil rights movement was to turn the language of the civil rights movement against civil rights, right? So there was no belief in a colorblind constitution among segregationists. They believed in a race specific, right? We have a right to discriminate against you. Then as soon as we passed the civil rights legislation that says you can't use race to harm black people, now we can't use race at all. We can't use race to help people. If you try to use race to undo a 350-year-old system of segregation, that's a problem. Same thing with gerrymandering, right? So we can create gerrymandering to help black folks to elect people that they want. But now we can say, well, that's unfair. That's racist. And so now we can use gerrymandering to basically what they've done in like Alabama, right? They do dilute what they just did in Florida is they gerrymander these crazy districts to keep all of black people in a handful of districts and they lose representative power. So, I mean, this is, when you say like, I, I, you know, I, I don't like to deal with the present, the point to me is that all of this past is shaping our present. That you cannot understand America if you don't understand the legacy of slavery and you don't understand the legacy of anti-blackness, that it, it shapes and corrupts nearly every institution we have in our society, and yet because we don't learn the history, we can pretend to have this amnesia, this willful ignorance about why things are like they are. It's how you get a conversation about affirmative action, that the people who have been shut out of these institutions for 250 years, that acknowledging that is somehow discriminating against people who are overrepresented, right? Because then we, we, can, we can have all of these conversations without history, without context, without having to actually face and conf confront reality. So my work is saying, like we all know race is a construct, right? Blackness is, doesn't exist. Blackness was created to create whiteness and to justify who could be enslaved and who couldn't. So everything that we're seeing is not because we're black. I mean, I'm genetically more European than African, right? But the construct of America will say that I'm black. And the construct of America will say that I'm black because I descend from slavery. So everything that we're seeing in society is really against the descendants of slavery. It's not about race or black. There's nothing innate about that. It's a society that for 250 years thought people from Africa with one drop of African blood could be enslavable. Then for another 100 years said people with one drop of black blood could undergo racial apartheid. And now we want to pretend that it's just about race and race is made up so we shouldn't pay attention in race anymore. It's really about a lineage, a lineage and a legacy that needs to be addressed. 100%. You, yeah, you, brought up a, you brought up affirmative action. I'm not gonna let you get out of here without speaking about that a little bit. Um, just, just to make sure everybody knows, affirmative action is dying. It's done. It will be done in June of uh, next year. The Supreme Court will kill it. Um, I want to ask you more, um, less about w how they're going to kill it, because they are, um, and more about kind of what you see going forward in terms of kind of a post-affirmative action world. Um, um, like uh, uh, you just started, uh, uh, Kristen, the, the Center for Journalism at Howard. How are HBCUs going to, do you perceive them playing a role in this post-affirmative action world. And just what, what do you think it happens next 
um, after the Supreme Court um, amazingly says that you can consider a person's um, gender, legacy status, how rich their parents are, whether or not they can dunk a basketball, whether or not they can play water polo very well, but you can't consider a person's race. After the Supreme Court says that, right. what's, what comes next in, the, in our educational world? So I, I, I really do try never to predict the future, um, but what I will say is really affirmative action has already been done right? It, it has already died the death of a thousand cuts. When you think about what the Supreme Court has ruled about affirmative action, that all of the reasons affirmative action was created are not legitimate under the Constitution anymore. So the only pathway, so the court has ruled um, that you can't use affirmative action to remedy past discrimination, which is why affirmative action was literally created. You can't use affirmative action uh, to deal with current disadvantage. But you can use affirmative action for diversity because diversity is a societal good, which is, means it's not to benefit us, but to w benefit white people, right? Um, and then the primary beneficiaries of affirmative action outside of white women, which it's always amazing to me that we just ignore that. And I'm gonna tell you why we ignore that because affirmative action has never been about unqualified people getting a job. So it's not a bad thing that white women have benefited from affirmative action. What that means is the people who have been shut out of society and opportunities have gotten a fair chance, and when they get a fair chance, they actually can compete and succeed. But yet white women, of course, have been used to sue to limit affirmative action because you get the benefit of it, but not the burden. Um, so when we think about how affirmative action, which was specifically supposed to be a program for the descendants of slavery. It came out of the civil rights movement to say people who had been legally prohibited from holding jobs, from going into colleges, because they descended from slavery, if that was an affirmative program of discrimination, you have to take affirmative action to undo the results of that affirmative uh, discrimination. But now we've come to think of it as anybody who's faced any generalized uh, disadvantage the primary um, targets of affirmative action have been the least beneficiaries for a while now. We can look at Ivy League colleges. Uh, the main black people who get the benefits at Ivy League colleges are children of immigrants or immigrants. <laughs> it's true, right? No, I, I, I told but, the story. Well, but that's not what affirmative action was designed to address. And so because it's become so muddied and because we now think of it as you know, some kid getting an unfair advantage and not as having to remedy past and ongoing discrimination, um, it's already been largely dead. So black students in America are underrepresented in colleges with so-called affirmative action. We are overrepresented in for-profit predatory colleges, right? That's why we have the most debt. That's why we have the graduation rates that we have. So. Yes, it's, it, it is going to go away and I, it will have a harmful effect. The, the, the data is clear on this. We can look to California. We will see fewer black students getting in. Um, and so what I'm, what I'm pushing for, one, I do think this is going to, we are gonna see a, re, a resurgence. We're already seeing it because of the Trump administration black students choosing historically black colleges. And I know every time I go out and give a talk at a PWI, I'm recruiting because every black student who's like talking about how terrible their experience is, I'm like, come on, come home. I really am, I'm like, come home, it's not, it's not worth it. Um, and it's only going to get worse. But what, what I'm hoping, what I'm hoping, because universities could let in, they, they let in who they want. They always have, they always will. So this pretend helplessness, or, or what are we gonna do? You already, with affirmative action, were under-enrolling black students. So if you want to enroll those students, you'll find a way to enroll those students. I worked in college admissions, and I know you pick who you want. Um, no college lines up, that they have 100 slots, and they take the top 100 test scores and let those students in. They're always looking at a variety of factors. But what I'm really pushing for is a lineage-based affirmative action, that colleges, need to adopt affirmative action based on the lineage of you having been a descendant from American slavery. Target the people that it was supposed to be targeted because clearly um, legacy admissions are lineage affirmative action. 
you are coming from a lineage of people, one, who were allowed by law to attend those schools, which we weren't, um, and it's not based on anything that you've done, but you were born into it, the same way that we were born into a legacy of slavery. So I don't know what's going to happen, uh, but I'm hoping that we can turn our way of thinking about these programs. And let me just quickly say this. Um, because the polling shows there's two things where white allyship really, really falls down. You got the Black Lives Matter sign in your yard. Reparations, majority of white Democrats oppose reparations and they oppose affirmative action. And they think it's unfair to them. But the only way you can think affirmative action is unfair to you is if you naively and despite all the facts and research believe that we have a merit a meritocracy. We know that black students, not for a day in this country, have ever received an equal education. We know that the more black students in a school, the less resources, the worse quality of teacher, um, they don't have the same coursework, they have less access to college prep curriculum, they have worse facilities, they have worse technology, everything that you can measure, black students have worse if they're in a black school. And yet suddenly, when it comes to applying, we know all that. Like, Raise your hand if you're shocked by that. Like literally, raise your hand. No one's shocked by that. We know black kids don't get an equal education in this country. Like, I don't care what your politics are, conservative, progressive, you know that. And yet when it comes to applying to college, then we wanna say everybody should be treated, treated the same or it won't be a meritocracy. That's just, right, we're lying to ourselves. So to me, the kid who went to a failing high school, who worked his ass off, right? Went to that school, took the best courses he could take at that school, got the best grades he could get, and no, didn't score well on a test because he hasn't received a quality education. That kid deserves to get led into that school. Or the test prep course, or the tutoring, or the... Or, right, all of the things, right? All of those things. Or a high school where you can get a 4.4 on a four-point scale, but his class doesn't have chemistry. Right, his school doesn't offer that. So we know that we have an unfair system, and yet we all want to uh, continue to support it because in the end, we want our kid to get the advantage. So anyway, that's how I feel on affirmative action. Sorry, y'all. She's about to come up here and pull us off the stage. Let me turn this microphone. <laughs> Getting the hook. Um, it, it is my very sad duty to, to bring this conversation to an end. That was just amazing. Um, I think the two of you were meeting for the first time and we were privileged to be here for it. So thank you. Wow, um, that was a lot for all of us to think about for a very long time. Thank you. Congratulations to Professor Hammer Jones and thank you for joining us. Um, thanks to all of you for coming tonight and helping us celebrate three decades of publishing in the public interest. Thank you to Nicole and Fritz's family for being here. Um, thank you to our gala, co I'm just gonna do this, you don't have to clap after every person, but thank you from the bottom of my heart to our gala co-chairs, Sarah and Cynthia. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, we have many authors in the room, in addition to uh, Anya Schifrin and Ellie and Sah Sahila. Um, I saw Janet Bell here, I saw Miles Rappaport, I saw, I think I saw Danielle Sered, Jessica Neuwirth, John Cowell. If I've missed you, I'm sorry, maybe you could wave if you're a new press author. There would be no, new, there we go. There would be no new press without new press authors. 
Thank you, and thank you for coming out tonight. Um, we have a number of board members here. I know I saw Tony Butler in the front row here from the Brennan Center, and thank you for your support tonight. Uh, Brad Habel is here, who is the chair of our finance committee. Jessica Bauman, who helped fill the room in a wonderful, wonderful way. Bruce Gottlieb. Uh, John Duff might be here from our finance committee. Maddie Goldberg, I saw you. Could our board members stand in our finance committee stand and be recognized? Thank you. Um, I have the most incredible staff in publishing. Uh, my colleagues are just so amazing. Um, I, well, first of all, why don't, why don't New Press staff members stand for one minute, please? Thank you. And um, I'm sorry, uh, Fran Forte, could you keep standing, please? I have been working with Fran Forte for a quarter of a century. She is our production director. She makes our books gorgeous. She gets them on time. She gets them when there's no paper, when there are no delivery trucks, when the world is falling apart. Um, Fran, it has been a pleasure. It continues to be a pleasure. Uh, she celebrated her 25th anniversary at the New Press this year. Um, I also, I want to recognize the senior management team at the New Press. My very dear colleagues, you heard about our person of the year, publishing's person of the year, Ellen Adler. And my colleague, Mark Favreau, who is our director of editorial programs. Mark is responsible for the editorial list for many, many of the books that I listed before, the prize-winning books, the important books. Um, I have worked with Mark for many, many years, and it is a pleasure every single day. Now, is Rosa here? Did I see Rosa? We have a new CFAO who is the fourth member of our team, um, and uh, uh, just brand new this year, Chief Finance and Administrative Officer. She changed my life. Uh, <laughs> it's great. She does all the things that... I don't want to do anymore. Um, and she, I wondered, you know, how much she got the new press. And I knew she was a, a, a new presser. Uh, when we're going, we're going back to the office two days a week, as of a couple of weeks ago, I walked in the first day, the elevators opened, and there was a huge sign that said, the new press reoccupies Wall Street. <laughs> that was Rosa. Woo! Um, I want to recognize our funders and the people who have made tonight and other nights like this possible. First of all, our fearless funders are Ethel Klein and Ed Krugman, who couldn't be here tonight, but have long been um, leaders in, in terms of uh, supporting the new press. And then our social justice champions, I'm just gonna read a list because y'all know who you are, but I wanna say your names. Uh, the Brennan Center for Justice, Rick Burns, Cravath, Swain, and Moore, board member Amy Glickman, Debbie and Jonathan Klein, Gary Lipman, Nancy Meyer, and Mark Weiss. Mark is here tonight. Svetlana and Herb Wachtel, Aggie Gund, David and Susan Rockefeller. David's here tonight. Katrina Vanden Hubel, Shannon Wu, and Joe Kahn, and Abby Disney. And to everyone else on our host committee and front list ticket buyers, the full list of supporters is in the program. Please look at it. These are very important people. They are supporting independent media at a, at a, a time when independent media is very important to support. Um, I want to thank Harper's Magazine and The Nation Magazine. You have their latest issue in your gift bag as you go out. Thank you to our photographer, Christian Rodriguez, our video team, Tim Persinko, and everyone at Owl Ear Media. To Miles Shebar, my dear friend, uh, for creating our video. To Sean Campbell, yeah, great video, Miles. Sean Campbell and the whole Edison Ballroom staff for making this such a seamless experience. To our events team, Robin Bellamy and Aaron Powers for their hand in working and planning and producing tonight's event. Kevin Keenan for his ongoing behind the scenes support and, and uh, words of wisdom in my ear. To our incredible development staff led by James Phelan and his colleagues Aranga Fernando and Andres Valcarcel. The New Press is extremely lucky to have such a talented and dedicated development staff. Aranga Fernando is our major gifts officer. If you have not met Aranga, Find him and introduce yourself. Um, stay in touch with him. He knows about free events. He can get you free books. 
He would like to meet your friends who like to read. Um, you are all part of the New Press family now, and we want to hear from you and help connect you with the kinds of books and authors that bring you, bring you here tonight. Lastly, if you are so inspired and haven't had a chance to donate this, to this event yet, you will find QR codes on a number of signs around the exits. Please use your phones and consider making a contribution, or we have a donate button on our website. Here is to seeing you all again next year. Thank you, thank you, and good night.